first two slides. <laughs> All right. Today I want to talk about our future in space. <laughs> it's no laughing matter, actually. <laughs> Is a planetary surface the right place for expanding technological civilization? This question was first asked in 1969 by Dr. O'Neill to his Princeton physics class. And when they started to look at it, they realized that the, question, the answer to the question was, in fact, no. A planetary, planetary surface is not the right place for an expanding civilization. In fact, you could build colonies in space that have their own um, environment. You could have artificial gravity like Earth, which no other planet has. You could engineer your own temperature, so year-round is room temperature. You can try out new government systems. So O'Neill got so excited about this, he wrote a book called The High Frontier. And this became the textbook on how to build colonies in space. And you know, the interesting thing is it wasn't science fiction. The way he wrote it, he used the technology of the day, of the 1970s, to show how it was possible. He showed how the space shuttle program that was about to come online would provide the technology needed to start these colonies, how you could use the external tank of the shuttle, put it in orbit, and build colonies around it. Now, I first read this book, The High Frontier, when I was an undergrad in aerospace engineering, and it really changed my way of thinking what I would do with my life. You know, I first, before reading the book, I thought one day I would work for NASA and I would help make those incremental changes that NASA is so famous for. And I realized after reading the book that this wasn't what I wanted to do with my life, that I wanted to make these colonies happen. I imagine what it would be like to live in a colony where along the center line where, the, where it rotates, the gravity is zero and you could be on the ground and watch zero gravity sports above your head. And what it would be like to live in the most beautiful city and have human-powered flight above you. And I really wanted to live here. I wanted to live here so much that I realized that would be my life goal. That would be my purpose, to make space colonies a reality. So I started to look at it and understand, why haven't we created these yet? You know, O'Neill said we could do it in the 70s, and he showed how the technology existed then, and why haven't we made any headway towards this goal? So I started to understand the problems with the space industry. I tried to understand what is holding us back. What I realized, is that every problem the space industry has is all summed up into one specific problem. One bottleneck is holding the entire space industry back. And I'd like to share that today. And that problem is pretty simple. It's Earth's gravity well. Earth's gravity well, the fact that the mass of the Earth makes it so hard to leave the planet is what's holding everything back and what's making it so hard to go to space. You know, the Apollo astronauts had to travel 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet to go to the moon. 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet. And in fact, that's how fast anything has ever had to travel if it had to leave the gravity well of Earth. So what, does that, what has that done to, to the way we build everything we've ever put in space? You can imagine it's very complex. It's led to high development cost. Everything we've ever put into space costs a lot of money. It takes decades to build our spacecraft. Because it's so hard to get it there, we have to spend a lot of time, a lot of resources, to build everything we put there. And because of that, it's led to a can't-fail attitude. You know, NASA's famous for the mantra, failure is not an option. But that won't work in the private industry. In the private industry, failure has to be an option. In fact, the mantra for the private industry should be, fail early, fail often. You have to fail early, and you have to fail often. You have to learn from your failures so that you can move forward. But that's not how the space industry works today, unfortunately. We are in that failure is not an option mode. And because of that, that's led to a, a mindset where you get just one shot. So if you're sending a mission to the moon, you're only sending one. And it's going to take you a decade, maybe, to build that mission. So you better be sure that that launch vehicle works. And you better be sure that your translunar injection works and that your lander can land on the moon and that you can deploy your science and you can send that communication back to Earth. Because if anything fails, it's mission failure. Today, we can't send 100 missions to the moon, and that's the problem. And because of that, because you have just one shot, we've added too much mass and too much complexity to everything we do in space, and it's completely inefficient. So one problem I just want to point out, there's lots of problems that the space industry has had because of the underlying problem, the gravity well. This one in, in particular is space debris. There's over 19,000 classified space debris objects in orbit, and most of this is due to um, non-functional spacecraft spacecraft that ran out of fuel or collided with other spacecraft. And you know, a lot of the world depends on global positioning systems in orbit and communication satellites. And these are constantly at risk of getting knocked out by space debris. It's a huge problem 
that, that we have the opportunity to solve. So I realized this problem and I wanted to understand what the solution could be. And it turns out I, I figured out what the solution is to, to the, space, the space industry's problems when I was studying at Singularity University in the, the summer of 2010. Uh, so while I was here, we, we studied um, some very interesting technologies, technologies that are changing at exponential rates. And I realized that the, the solution to the space industry's problem lies within the technology, within the tools that we have today that we didn't have yesterday, and the tools that we'll have tomorrow that you could have never imagined 10, 20 years ago. And that's going to be the solution to our problems. And if you can learn how to capitalize on these tools, you'll be able to build your own companies. So the underlying thing is exponential technologies. If you take five steps in a linear passion, one, two, three, four, five, you're on the other side of the room. Take ten, five steps in exponential, two, four, eight, 16, 32, you're on the other side of the city. So that's the difference between a linear progression and exponential. And it turns out some technologies actually increase at exponential rates. So who's heard of Moore's Law, right? Moore's Law. Moore's Law is an exponential trend, very predictable, that says the cost of computing uh, increases exponentially. Um, it doubles about every 18 months. So you go from relays to vacuum tubes to transistors, integrated circuits, and it's completely predictable. And th what that's done is it's allowed us to understand the growth of computing. We can very accurately predict the price of a personal computer and when it will have the computation power of a mouse brain, a human brain, and one day all the brains of, of humanity. And what's interesting is a lot of other technologies build off of information technology and off of computation. So nanotech, biotech, robotics, AI, these things all increase at exponential rates, and it's very predictable. So at Singularity, we studied these technologies, and then we had to understand how we could use them to affect one billion people in 10 years. And I was interested in how I could use exponential technologies to uh, impact um, people through the space industry, which seemed like a daunting task, right, to, to affect a billion people through the space industry in a positive way. But I found out that a lot of the problems that we solve for space will help people on Earth, right? So, you know, as we develop new worlds, we're going to help the developing world. There's over 30,000 children die every single day of curable diseases, and this is happening mostly in the developing world. Could you imagine what it will be like when we colonize another world and have to learn how to be sustainable, have to grow our own food, process our own water, recycle our own waste. Those same technologies and lessons we learn there will come back to Earth here and help bring up the standard of living for everybody. Another interesting uh, problem that humanity is facing, which is a growing threat, is the lack of resources. I know this is a, a scary looking plot, but what it shows is, is all the different resources and how quickly we're running out of them. So these are rare Earth resources, gold, titanium, platinum, copper, these things that we depend on for our technology, but we're going to run out of. And it turns out that these rare earth resources actually come from asteroids. So if you go into space, it's far more abundant. If we do off earth resource mining, even on the moon or the asteroid belt, we could do all the processing there and bring the materials back to earth for consumption. One more problem, which is pretty much the big problem of the day, right, is clean energy, renewable energy, global warming. This can be solved in space too. It's not a new idea, but it's going to take exponential technologies to solve it, and that's with space-based solar power. Collecting solar energy before it is degraded through Earth's atmosphere and beaming it back down as, as a microwave. So these are all solutions that can come out of exponential technology, and I want to talk about just one technology in particular that excites me a lot. Um, and I realized this when I went back to the underlying problem, Earth's gravity well, and realized um, I, I wanted to understand what was what was the fundamental problem today because of Earth's gravity well? Now this is a picture of a ship in the middle of a city. It doesn't make any sense, right? Why would a ship ever be built in the middle of a city? It wouldn't. It, it's built on the shore which it sails on. But unfortunately, this is exactly how the space industry is today. We build all of our rockets and everything we've ever put into space on the surface of the Earth and we have to launch it from here. Uh, it's a huge problem and it's completely inefficient and it's the reason why we're not going to get to the space colonies that we've been dreaming of since the 70s. We have to look at it in a new way. And what I realized is that the obvious solution is to build things in space. We can get rid of that entire Earth's gravity well problem if we don't have to build things on the surface of the Earth. So obviously we build things in space, but how are we going to do that? 
This is not a new idea. It's been talked about before O'Neill. It's been talked about in science fiction. And when they showed pictures of how to do it and described how it would be done, they always used the, the old technologies, right? They, they showed how astronauts would be construction workers and there'd be hundreds of them building these colonies. And that's never going to happen. Could you imagine hundreds of astronauts trying to build um, infrastructure in space? That's the reason it hasn't happened. But it turns out there is a technology that's growing at exponential rates that's going to allow us to build what we need in space. And that technology is called 3D printing. 3D printing is interesting. It's, it's uh, an additive manufacturing technology, unlike most technology that is a manufacturing that is subtractive, where you start with bulk material and carve away your part. 3D printing builds parts layer by layer. So in the end, you just have the finished part. And it's pretty neat. You can build tools that have movable parts inside of them. You can build conduit lines that carry fluids with 90 degree turnoffs. You never have to bend a, a metal pipe anymore. You can build aerospace grade aluminum and titanium and stainless steel and turbine blades with integrated cooling channels and rocket nozzles. And what's most exciting, you can build structures that could have never been built any other way. Imagine building a lattice structure that was perfectly optimized for the space environment and it can carry loads and be fractions of the mass of the structures we build today. So the, the neat part about it is it gets rid of that underlying problem. No more do we have to build our space craft and our space structures to fit inside the launch fairing of a rocket. It never has to survive the rigors of launch, the vibration loads and the gravitational loads. In the beginning, all we have to do is send up the feedstock, the raw materials, but that's fine because it can, it's essentially gray goo. It just fits into the launch vehicle however it needs to go. In the long run, we'll do our resource mining in space, so we'll be completely Earth independent. We get our resources there and we build the things we need there. So what I, I really think is happening, and I truly believe this, there, there will be a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift where one day everything in space is made in space. And I, I realized this, and my partners realized this too, and because of that, we created a company, and the company is called Made in Space. So the idea of Made in Space is to take 3D printing technology and apply it to space, bring it to space, and start manufacturing there, and show people that we can build those space colonies, and we can be completely Earth-independent one day. And I want to tell you this story because it's pretty interesting. We started Made in Space just one year ago. And this is a testament to what a small group can do in the space industry creating a startup. Because in one year, we've gained the attention from NASA. We have a NASA contract to fly zero gravity flights and, uh, and one day suborbital. We'll be flying the first 3D printer to space on a suborbital rocket um, by 2013. So to date, in the past three months, we've been flying on the zero gravity airplane. We've logged over two hours of weightless manufacturing time, far more than NASA has been able to do in their existence. And, and it's really amazing that we've been able to do all this. And people think it's, they think it's very amazing that we could go from this concept to acting on the concept so quickly. And honestly, it's not that amazing to me because what we've done, having this great idea, bootstrapping it, failing on some ideas and learning from our failures and keep building, all that is, is the mindset of a startup. What's surprising is the space industry hasn't seen a, enough startups to recognize them when they do. So what's the next step for Made in Space? It's pretty exciting. We, we're taking the technology that we've developed and the understanding of how to do manufacturing in zero gravity, and we're building the first proof of concept. We're building a machine, the first of its kind, that will show the world that you can manufacture in, in weightlessness. And we're going to fly this machine on the International Space Station by 2014. What's interesting is that it will be used by astronauts. So astronauts will have the ability, finally, to build tools and spare parts on demand, to build the emergency fixes that they never could plan for when they need it and right away. And even more interesting, we'll be able to build small spacecraft in our system and launch it from the International Space Station. So could you imagine building a small CubeSat that is fractions of the, the structural mass because it never had to survive launch. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Now, if you're wondering, yes, the answer to the question is yes, we are building the Star Trek replicator. So I want to end on, on this one point. Computers used to take up entire buildings. They are extremely hard to use. It took trained professionals to use them. They weren't good at doing many things besides government activities and being used in the research setting. If you went back to 2045 and told someone 
that one day our computers would fit in our pockets and they would have the computational power far greater than any of their room computers and it would contain all the world's information, they wouldn't believe you, right? Now, I would argue that the space industry today is following the same trends that the computer industry um, followed in the past. Now, it's going to take a conscious decision on our part to create the future we want. But just imagine, imagine the world that one day we could live in.